Introductory Organic Chemistry, Reaction Mechanisms of Aromatics, also known as arenes. In this first organic course, we'll be looking at five electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, the ones shown here, in addition to bromination, oxidation, and hydrogenation of alkyl side chains. Let's start with the structure of the simplest aromatic, benzene. Now the following average carbon to carbon bond lengths are measured in many organic compounds. A carbon to carbon single bond, 1.54 angstroms. A carbon to carbon double bond is a little shorter, 1.34 angstroms. And a carbon to carbon triple bond is shorter still, 1.20 angstroms. Now an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. And if we compare that with a more familiar unit, a nanometer, one nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. So you can see that an angstrom is 10 times smaller than a nanometer. So 10 angstroms makes a nanometer. When we look at aromatic compounds, the carbon to carbon bond length is unique. It's 1.39 angstroms for all carbon to carbon bonds in an aromatic ring. So it lies between the single and double bond length. And this indicates, well, first of all, that all of the bonds are equivalent length and that the length is intermediate between that of a single and double bond and therefore you might describe them as one and a half bonds. The structure of benzene is drawn in several ways and all of these are equivalent. Notice there are three pi bonds and they can be drawn in any position provided that they're alternating, provided we show the ring is fully conjugated. Now valence bond theory predicts that in benzene all six carbons are sp2 hybridized. So if take a look at this carbon for example here. It's got uh, sigma bond here, sigma bond here, sigma and pi bond here. Now recall that pi bonds are made from unhybridized orbitals and so if we just uh, count sigma bonds there are three sigma bonds and therefore it would be sp2 hybridized. Recall that uh, pi bonds occupy the same space as sigma bonds and so they're counted as part of the same electron cloud as the sigma bond. You could say that this carbon has three electron clouds, one, two, three. Therefore, it needs three hybridized orbitals, which would be sp2 hybridized. Now, benzene is a flat, planar, hexagonal ring uh, with carbon to carbon bond angles of 120 degrees. It's completely conjugated. Each of the carbons has a single unhybridized 2pz orbital with one electron in it. So there are a total of six pi electrons that are delocalized around the ring by overlapping p orbitals. So the structure on the left shows one arrangement and the structure on the right shows a different arrangement of overlap, but in fact we could blend these together. The overlapping p orbitals form a circular electron cloud above and below the ring. Let's take a look at the stability of benzene. If you recall uh, the tests for unsaturation that we carried out on alkenes, alkenes undergo electrophilic addition with bromine forming saturated bromoalkanes. It's a rapid reaction. Alkenes are oxidized by coal permanganate, producing a syn-vic diol. It's called the Bayer's test. And alkenes react with conch sulfuric acid, producing alkyl bisulfates. But the same tests carried out on benzene are unreactive. Bromination, oxidation with coal permanganate, conch sulfuric acid with benzene, no reaction. Let's look at hydrogenation. Uh, benzene stability is also seen in its relatively low heat of hydrogenation. Let's compare the following. Now cyclohexane with one carbon to carbon bibond is hydrogenated to cyclohexane and releases 28 kcal per mole. It's exothermic. 1,3 cyclohexadiene with two carbon to carbon uh, pi bonds 
requires two equivalents of hydrogen and releases almost exactly double the quantity of a single carbon to carbon pi bond, 55 kcals per mole is released instead of 56, which would be double. And based on these first two heats of hydrogenation, one would expect that the hydrogenation of benzene with three carbon to carbon pi bonds would be three times 28 or 84 kcals per mole. But in fact, you see, it only releases 49 kcals per mole. So benzene is 84 minus 49, that is 35 kcals per mole, more stable than a cyclic triene should be. And so 135 cyclohexatriene, which this might have been named, does not exist, but is actually a stable aromatic compound, which we call benzene. The most important reactions of aromatics are electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, EAS for short. An electrophile, that is an electron acceptor, substitutes or replaces a hydrogen on an aromatic ring. And by choosing proper reagents, it is possible to halogenate, that is, replace hydrogen with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. It is possible to nitrate the ring, substituting an, a nitro group for a hydrogen. It is possible to sulfonate, that is, replace a hydrogen with a sulfonic acid group. To alkylate a ring, and that would be substituting an alkyl group for a hydrogen. And finally, one could acylate uh, an aromatic ring, and that is, replace a hydrogen with an acyl group. Bromination of aromatic rings. A benzene ring with its uh, six pi electrons in a cyclic conjugated system is a nucleophile. It's a site of electron density. It's an electron donor. In addition, benzene rings are sterically accessible to electrophiles with their electron density above and below the ring. And thus, benzene acts as a Lewis base or a nucleophile or electron donor and reacts, reacts with electron acceptors which are Lewis acids or electrophiles. Recall electrophilic addition reactions of alkenes. Example hydrogen halides like HCl add to alkenes. The carbon to carbon pi electrons attack the delta plus hydrogen in HCl and abstract the hydrogen ion that the alkene becomes protonated. Chloride leaves with the pair of electrons forming chloride anion. And then finally, chloride adds to the carbocation. Electrophilic aromatic substitution, EAS, begins the same. However, aromatics are less reactive towards electrophiles than alkenes. Uh, specifically, bromine in carbon tetrachloride reacts instantly with most alkenes, but does not react with benzene, or only very, very slowly. And so, in the bromination of benzene, we need a catalyst, FeBr3. The catalyst reacts with bromine to make a weak electrophile into a strong electrophile. It forms an electrophilic complex, FeBr4 minus Br plus. Here it is. Now, whether it's fully ionic or not is probably not, but close to it. So here's a strong electrophile that's almost a full bromonium cation. This complex bromine molecule is then attacked by the pi electron system of the nucleophilic benzene ring and a slow rate limiting uh, step to yield this uh, non-aromatic carbocation intermediate. Now, as the bromine accepts a pair of electrons to, from this pi bond, FeBr4- is the leaving group. This carbocation, which is ortho to the halogen, is delocalized or spread out across the other ortho and para position by resonance in which a pi bond flips from one side of an atom to another, and this generates a cation in the para position and a second resonance puts another carbocation in the ortho position. So this is delocalization, it's resonance, it's spreading out uh, the charge. 
So although it's more stable than a typical carbocation because of the resonance, this intermediate is much less stable, of course, than the starting aromatic material. And this um, first step is thus endothermic. The second step of this electrophilic aromatic substitution is different than the addition reactions of alkenes. So uh, bromide, which I'm showing here as FeBr4-, abstracts a hydrogen ion from the bromine-bearing carbon, uh, which restores the neutral stable aromatic compound. So the pair of electrons fall back and re-establish aromaticity. And this second step is exothermic, whereas the addition of bromine to the carbocation would uh, destroy aromaticity and would be actually be endothermic. Other halogenations are possible. Uh, aromatic chlorination and iodination work similar to bromination. Fluorine reacts so rapidly with benzene that monofluorination is difficult. In the case of chlorine, we would add chlorine and a catalyst, FeCl3, to the aromatic, and it occurs uh, happily at room temperature. In the case of iodination, uh, FeI3 does not work very well, and that's because it's not very polar. Iron has an electronegativity of 1.7, and iodine is 2.5. The difference between them is rather small, so it doesn't polarize iodine very much. Instead, we're going to have to uh, actually oxidize iodine to iodinium ion and iodinium ion is a good electron acceptor and will react with an aromatic. In order to oxidize it they typically add nitric acid or peroxide or copper 2 chloride oxidizing iodine to the iodinium ion. So here's a reaction of iodine with copper 2 ion producing iodinium ion and copper 1 ion. Alternately, iodine in the presence of nitric acid is oxidized to iodinium ion and the nitric acid is reduced to nitrogen dioxide. So here's that reaction mechanism. Starting with the iodinium ion, the aromatic carbon-to-carbon uh, -carbon pi bond attacks the iodinium ion. Uh, that breaks the aromaticity, produces a carbocation adjacent to the halogen added. Now we don't have any I minus to um, deprotonate the ring, but water is present here, and so water can act as the um, nucleophile to remove the hydrogen ion and restore aromaticity. So there's iodobenzene from benzene using iodinium ion produced by oxidation. Now a promoter, which is what we would call copper 2 or nitric acid, is a reagent that reacts stoichiometrically and it is consumed but it's not regenerated, it's not a catalyst. So things like copper 2 and nitric acid and peroxide would be called promoters. The promoter, you notice, does not occur in the product. Let's look next at aromatic nitration. A mixture of concentrated nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid, a rather mean brew, will produce a very strong electrophile, a nitronium ion, NO2+, and this will readily substitute even on a weak nucleophile like an aromatic ring. So the first step is to produce the nitronium ion. Sulfuric acid is a very strong acid, its pKb is listed as negative 3, and nitric acid would therefore be acting as a Bronsted base, a proton acceptor. Now I have not seen a pKb for nitric acid, but certainly must be less basic than even water, so the pKb is likely greater than 16. Nevertheless, um, it is protonated by the strong acid, at least to a small extent. Now of the three oxygens that would be the donor, electron donors, I would suggest this would be the most likely to donate with its negative charge, but it's not the oxygen uh, that will produce, that allows the reaction to go forward. Second best choice would, I believe, would be this oxygen with its pi bond, but again, this produces no further product. It's actually the least likely oxygen that allows the reaction to go forward. So protonation of, of this uh, oxygen produces the uh, oxonium ion, and this can move forward as it uh, dehydrates. Water is a reasonably good leaving group, producing this very powerful nitronium ion uh, electrophile. 
Notice I've drawn uh, equilibrium arrows here, meaning that the reaction is not uh, strongly to the right. In fact, it probably only proceeds to a very small extent to the right. But as this tiny quantity of nitronium ion is used in the next step of the reaction, uh, the right side of the reaction is depleted, and by Le Chatelier's principle, we know that the reaction will keep shifting to produce more and more of the nitronium ion as needed. So here's the nitronium ion reacting with the aromatic. The pi bond breaks on collision and donates to the nitronium cation. As nitrogen adds, it forms a, a carbocation. Now, uh, water is able to then de deprotonate and restore the aromaticity of the ring, resulting in a yield of about oh, 85 percent of nitrobenzene, even at low temperatures. And this temperature must be controlled on the low side so we don't get multiple nitrations occurring. Nitration of an aromatic ring followed by reduction with, say, for example, something as simple as iron in HCl or stannous chloride in HCl will yield an aryl amine, such as aniline. And this reaction is used in the preparation of many pharmaceuticals. So here we have nitrobenzene being reduced by stannous chloride in acid, followed by um, basification with hydroxide, producing aniline to a high yield. Now, stannous chloride, SNCl2, is not soluble in water. And hence, that's why we use the hydronium ion. It dissolves in HCl, forming this uh, tetrachlorostanate 2 ion that we see that's the, re the reducing agent. At the end of the reaction, the oxidized form of the reducing agent is hexachlorostanate 4 ion. Next EAS reaction is aromatic sulfonation. So aromatic rings can be sulfonated by reaction with fuming sulfuric acid called oleum. This is a mixture of 100% sulfuric acid with sulfur trioxide gas dissolved in it. And it forms a very powerful electrophile uh, protonated S, uh, sulfur trioxide or even sulfur trioxide itself. So here's the first step, protonation of sulfur trioxide. Even before protonation, this sulfur is certainly a good electron acceptor. It's bonded to three electronegative oxygens. After protonation, it's even more electrophilic. So any one of these three oxygens can break a pi bond and be protonated. And here's the aromatic ring reacting with this HSO3 plus protonated sulfur trioxide. The sulfur accepts the pi electrons from the ring producing an arenium carbocation. And then, for lack of any better conjugate base in the house, bisulfate will pick up a hydrogen ion, uh, deprotonating that and restoring aromaticity, yielding neutral benzene sulfonic acid with a yield of approximately 50%. And notice sulf sulfuric acid catalyst is regenerated in the process. All of these steps are at equilibrium. Notice the equilibrium arrows, so the reaction is reversible. Sulfonation, the forward reaction, is favored by strong acid, and desulfonation, the reverse reaction, is favored in hot, dilute, aqueous acid. After sulfonation, alkali fusion is often performed. So if we heat an aromatic sulfonic acid, with sodium hydroxide at 300 degrees C in the absence of any solvent would cause replacement of the sulfonic acid group with a hydroxyl group and this will produce a phenol. For example, in this case we have para-toluene sulfonic acid, sodium hydroxide, 300 degrees C, followed by hydronium ion produces paracresol. Now, due to the severity of this reaction, only alkyl substituents, like a methyl or ethyl, would survive. Any halogens would be replaced in the same way the sulfonic acid group was replaced. Try this problem. Use line bond structures and curved arrows to show the acid-base reaction of phenol with sodium hydroxide. So here's a phenol. Now, phenol is a weak acid. It has a pK of approximately 10. Sodium hydroxide is a fairly strong base, negative 1.74. So that's going to be our electron donor, donating a pair of electrons to the acidic hydrogen. It's going to deprotonate phenol. The pair of electrons remains behind and forms 
this sodium phenoxide, which is the conjugate base of phenol. And so we can calculate its pKb to be 14 minus the pKa of the acid. So that's 14 minus 10 is 4.0. So it's a reasonably st moderately strong base, sodium phenoxide. Now this base can be uh, reprotonated and go back to the phenol if we react it with hydronium ion. So here's our base, donating a pair of electrons, abstracting a proton from hydronium ion, and that will form phenol. And with that, under that understanding is the key to what's going on in this reaction. You see, replacement of the sulfonic acid group with a hydroxyl group makes a phenol, which is a weak acid. This weak acid phenol will be deprotonated by the sodium hydroxide, producing a phenoxide. And if, in fact, we want to produce the phenol, we would need then a second step where we add hydronium ion to reprotonate the phenoxide actually back to the phenol form. The fourth reaction, EAS reaction of aromatics, is alkylation of an aromatic ring. It's called the Friedel-Crafts reaction. It's an important aromatic substitution reaction in which an alkyl group replaces a hydrogen and on an aromatic ring using strong acid catalysts. In this case, FeCl3 is not strong enough. The difference in electronegativity here is 3.0 minus 1.7 or 1.3, so it's quite polar but not ionic. In fact, we're going to use aluminum chloride, and the difference in electronegativity is 3.0 minus 1.5. That difference is 1.5, and that's on the borderline between ionic and polar covalent, so it's, uh, it's a stronger catalyst. So if we use aluminum chloride in the presence of an alkyl chloride, an aromatic ring reacts to produce an alkylated aromatic ring with byproduct HCl and aluminum chloride is simply regenerated. In this case, isopropyl chloride plus benzene produces isopropyl benzene, also known as cumene. Now, Aluminum chloride will polarize the alkyl halide just the way that FeBr3 polarized bromine. So here's AlCl3 polarizing the uh, alkyl chloride. Now, is it fully ionic or is it almost ionic? Well, it's probably somewhere in between, but I'm showing this as uh, partial, uh, like almost a carbocation here. Here I'm just going to show a mechanism for that where the chloride leaves bonding to the aluminum chloride, producing AlCl4 minus and an alkyl carbocation. This alkyl carbocation is certainly a good electrophile, so the carbon to carbon pi bond will bond to it. That produces a carbocation on the ring, an arenium cation. Uh, aluminum chloride, AlCl4 minus, will deprotonate the ring, restoring aromaticity, producing a neutral alkylated aromatic compound. AlCl4 minus plus H breaks apart into HCl and AlCl3 is regenerated. Now despite the importance of the Friedel-Crafts alkylation, and it is important, there are four uh, serious limitations for this reaction. The first one is that only alkyl halides can substitute only alkyl halides, that is aryl halides, aromatic halides won't substitute, so aryolation fails, although alkylation works. So here is um, benzene, an aromatic ring, a nucleophile, and let's say we attempt to add an aryl chloride instead of an alkyl chloride, well, we don't get a reaction. Now, why is that? Well, if you look at what's going on, our nucleophile, say in this case benzene, with its uh, cloud of pi electrons, has to hit the backside of this carbon, or at least get to this carbon, in order to displace the chloride. And in order to do so, well, this aryl chloride ha also has a cloud of electrons, the 2pz orbitals, and that will repel these electrons from the nucleophile. So it's just not going to happen because of this electron-electron repulsion. Now, similar to an aromatic is a vinyl halide. It won't substitute either. Vinyl groups will not add to aromatic rings, and it's pretty much the same reason. Here is a vinyl chloride. If you look at a um, bonding diagram, the vinyl chloride likewise has a pi bond right on the chloride that we're asking to substitute, and that, that cloud of electrons will repel the nucleophile so they can't get through to cause the substitution to occur. So the pi electrons of the benzene nucleophile are repelled by the pi electrons of the aryl 
or the vinyl halide because like charges repel. The second limitation of the Friedel-Crafts alkylation reaction is that any substituent more deactivating than a halogen prevents the reaction. And all of these aromatics that I've shown here have a substituent that is more deactivating than a halogen. And when I say deactivating, we mean they are electron withdrawing. So the aromatics shown below will not undergo Friedel-Crafts alkylation because they contain a substituent that is strongly electron withdrawing. So what is it about these substituents that makes them electron withdrawing? You start down here, it's pretty easy to see that this quaternary amine has a nitronium cation. This nitrogen is very electron deficient and so it's going to be an electron withdrawer from the ring, deactivating the ring. Likewise the nitro group, the nitrogen is a nitronium cation. This is an electron withdrawing group. It takes electron density out of the ring, making the ring a poorer electron donor. It can't donate and be behave as a nucleophile as it needs to do for this reaction. Look at the trifluoromethyl group. Now carbon itself, electronegativity 2.5, is not a problem, but it's the fact that this carbon is bonded to three very electronegative fluorines, makes this carbon electron deficient, makes this group electron withdrawing, pulls electron density out of the ring. The ring is now such a poor nucleophile, such a poor electron donor, that these alkylation reactions will fail. Look at the other ones. Here we have carbon and sulfur, or carbon. Uh, now in every case, sulfur and carbon are okay by themselves. Their electronegativity is two and a half, but in each case, Sulfur or carbon is bonded to a very electronegative atom, such as oxygen, multiple oxygens in this case, or nitrogen, which are all very electronegative. And that makes each of these carbon or sulfur atoms electron deficient, makes them electron withdrawing groups. The reactions of alkylation will fail. Surprisingly, even amino substituents, primary amines, secondary amines, and tertiary amines, which are Lewis bases, just like ammonia, they're electron donors, uh, they become strongly electron withdrawing in the presence of aluminum chloride catalyst. So the aluminum chloride is actually an acid, a Lewis acid. And so the amino groups are such good electron donors that they will actually react with the catalyst instead of donating electron density into the ring they donate electron density to aluminum chloride and produce this quaternary amine, nitronium ion, which now is electron withdrawing. So not only is it electron withdrawing, but it renders the aromatic ring unreactive and it destroys the catalyst. Third of four limitations of the friedel craft alkylation reaction is polyalkylation, which means that we're getting uh, multiple additions of the alkyl group on the aromatic ring. So polyalkylation occurs in addition to monoalkylation, especially since alkyl groups, once bonded to the aromatic ring, are electron donor groups. And that makes the product aromatic a stronger nucleophile than the starting material. So when the alkyl chloride uh, is near to both the starting material and the product, it is more inclined to react with the more reactive product, giving us perhaps two additions of the alkyl product, or three additions. Mixed products are never a desirable situation. High yields of the monoalkylation product are obtained only if we add a large excess of the aromatic reagent and a small quantity of the alkyl chloride. And then by sheer probability, uh, each alkyl chloride would be surrounded by many aromatic rings and would probably never see a product uh, molecule. And so the alkyl chloride reacts exclusively with the reagent. Now you wouldn't get a very uh, high yield, but then you would have to separate and distill the product out and then reintroduce the reagent, the benzene, back to the starting material again. So it's perhaps inefficient, but it does work. The fourth limitation of a Friedel-Crafts alkylation is that the alkyl group may rearrange, especially in the case of primary alkyl halides, even at low temperatures. So here we have benzene, and we're attempting to react it with N-butyl chloride, 
and produce N-butylbenzene. And some is produced, but in fact only about one-third of the product is N-butylbenzene. About two-thirds is sec-butylbenzene. So, so what's happened here? Well, recall that alkyl carbocations can rearrange by a hydride shift or a methyde shift. So for example, here is the um, primary butyl carbocation that would form when chloride leaves and butyl chloride but it's only primary and right next door is a hydrogen that can shift over with its pair of electrons producing a sec butyl carbocation this is uh, sec butyl and that would give rise to our other product that we see here here's another example here is a neopental carbocation uh, it's primary and the carbon next to it is quaternary with methyl groups and any one of those three methyl groups could slide over and produce a more stable tertiary carbocation in this case called a tert pentyl carbocation so for example benzene plus neopental chloride in the presence of aluminum chloride catalyst the alkyl chloride loses chloride ion forms a primary carbocation now some of that, when it collides with benzene, will produce some neopental benzene. But that would only be a minor product, because next door to this primary carbocation is this quaternary carbon. One of its methyl groups can hop right over, producing this more stable tertiary carbocation. It's a tert-pental uh, carbocation. And when benzene collides with it, we'll get then, in fact, tert pental benzene and this would be the major product with respect to the fourth limitation the carbocation rearrangements let's try this problem which of the following alkyl halides will undergo friedel craft alkylation without rearrangement so here we have ethyl chloride sec butyl chloride n propyl chloride isopentyl chloride and chlorocyclohexane. We'll start at the top. Now think about what would happen when chloride leaves to react with the aluminum chloride. It'll produce a primary carbocation, a primary ethyl group. Now this is not very stable, but there's no way for it to rearrange to anything more stable. And so that's all we, the only carbocation we have reacting with benzene. We get a single product, ethyl benzene. No rearrangements. How about sec butyl chloride? When this chloride leaves to react with aluminum chloride, we're going to get a secondary carbocation right here. And this is what it'll look like. Now there's no way for this to rearrange to anything more stable than a secondary carbocation. This sec butyl carbocation is the only carbocation we'll have. The exclusive product then, when it reacts with benzene, will be sec butyl benzene. And propyl chloride. When this chloride leaves, it'll form a primary carbocation, a propyl carbocation. But this propyl carbocation can rearrange by a hydride shift from the center carbon, producing a secondary carbocation. So we're going to have mixed products. Both of these carbocations will react with benzene. The major product we would predict would result, would derive from the isopropyl group rather than the n-propyl group. And so the main product will be isopropyl benzene. This is neopental chloride. Picture chloride leaving, forming a carbocation right here. This, in fact, is a primary carbocation right next to a quaternary carbon with three methyl groups. And one of those methyl groups can hop over, producing then a tertiary carbocation. So it will have mixed products, but the main product would result from the more stable carbocation, the tert pental group. So neopental rearranges a tert pental. The main product, therefore, is a tert pental benzene. And finally, chlorocyclohexane. Now, when chloride leaves, we'll have a cyclohexyl carbocation, which is secondary. And there's no way for this to rearrange to be anything more stable. And so the only carbocation is the one seen. And therefore, the exclusive product will be cyclohexyl benzene. So which of these will react without rearrangement? Well, the first, uh, ethyl chloride, the second, sec butyl chloride, and the last, chlorocyclohexane. The fifth and final electrophilic aromatic substitution is a Friedel-Crafts acylation reaction. 
and acyl group is an R carbonyl something. So here's an example R carbonyl something is an acyl group added to an aromatic ring um, using uh, a carboxylic acid chloride. This is actually should be CH3, carbonyl Cl, forgive the confusion here, in the presence of aluminum chloride catalyst to produce an aromatic ketone. Now the electrophile that's produced, that is the acyl cation that's produced, is resonance stabilized. Let's take a look at that. So here's the acid chloride, R carbonyl Cl, reacting with the Friedel Crafts catalyst, chloride leaves to join the aluminum chloride producing an acyl cation. This acyl cation will not rearrange. The carbocation cation doesn't move to any other carbons and the reason is because it's resonance stabilized with the W bonded oxygen. Notice the resonance here between in the different forms of the acyl cation. So here's an aromatic ring. Here's our acyl cation. The reaction would be our nucleophile donates to the acyl cation and aluminum chloride will deprotonate that restoring neutral aromaticity and we wind up with an aromatic ketone. Aluminum chloride is regenerated, HCl is a byproduct. Now as we just said the acyl cation will not rearrange because of its resonance stabilization. This is good. Furthermore poly substitution will not occur. so We wouldn't get multiple additions of the acyl group to the aromatic ring and this is because the acyl group is electron withdrawing and it's ring deactivating towards further EAS reactions. In addition, the electrophile can be aromatic. Recall with alkylation, the electrophile could only be an alkyl chloride and not an aryl chloride. Well, in this case, the electrophile can be an aromatic acid chloride, like benzoyl chloride. And we'll see that on the next slide. However, like Friedel Crafts alkylations, substituents more deactivating than a halogen prevent Friedel Craft acylation, and further amino groups will deactivate the catalyst the same way we saw with alkylation reactions. So an acyl group is a carbonyl group with an alkyl group attached, and they're named systematically by dropping the final E from the alkane name and adding the suffix OYL, oil. So here's an acyl group, and a single carbon acyl group would be methanoil, or common name formal. And here I'm listing that historically some of the smaller acyl uh, groups use common names, like, like formal. This is ethanoil, and the common name is acetyl. Here is propanoil, and here's benzoyl. These are all acyl groups. An acid chloride is an acyl group bonded to a chlorine atom, and acyl groups are then often called acid chlorides. So put a chloride on here, we have an acyl chloride or an acid chloride. Draw the structures of the acid chloride and aromatic that combine in a Friedel Craft acylation reaction to prepare the product shown. So here we have acetophenone. So this must have been the nucleophile, and then the acid chloride would have been this CH3 carbonyl Cl. It would have been ethanoyl chloride. So ethanoyl chloride, or acetyl chloride, plus benzene makes acetophenone. How about benzophenone? Well, in this case, one of these aromatic rings was the nucleophile, but the other piece would have been an acid chloride. So we'd have a phenyl group carbonyl chloride. There it is there, and that you would recognize as being benzoyl chloride. So you see that you can use an aromatic acid chloride in a Friedel Craft acylation reaction, whereas you can't use an aromatic alkyl chloride in an alkylation reaction. Substituent effects on substituted aromatic rings. Substituents on aromatic rings will affect both the reactivity and the orientation, that is the location of EAS. Take a look at the relative rates of nitration of the following aromatic compounds. This represents benzene with only hydrogen on it. And let's say its rate of nitration is one, say, mole per unit time. By comparison, the nitration of phenol is a thousand times faster than that of benzene. Huge difference. Chlorobenzene is about 30 times slower 
than that of benzene. And look at nitrobenzene. That's about 600 million times slower at nitration than benzene. Those are huge differences. So, so substituents affect EAS when they either donate or withdraw electron density to or from the ring. Now, substituents that donate electron density would make the ring a better nucleophile, a better electron donor, and stabilize the carbocation intermediate, and thus would activate the ring towards EAS. However, substituents that withdraw electron density from the ring would make the ring a poorer electron donor and would destabilize the carbocation and thus deactivate the ring towards EAS reactions. Now, substituents donate or withdraw electron density by either or both or of, of two of the following methods, using the inductive effect or the resonance effect. The inductive effect refers to movement of electron density through sigma bonds due to a difference in the electronegativity between the aromatic carbon and the atom that's bonded to it. Take a look at these examples down here. On the far right, we have an alkyl group, the methyl group. It is an electron donor. It donates electron density through the sigma bond. And this is because it's relatively large and polarizable. Try this. The sp2 hybridized carbon in the ring is more electronegative because it's one-third s character. That is, one of the three hybridized orbitals is s, so it's one-third s character whereas the sp3 hybridized alkyl group carbon is only one quarter s character. That is, one of the four um, hybridized orbitals is s character. Recall that s orbitals are closer to the nucleus and they hold their electrons tighter. And for this reason, um, alkyl groups donate electron density to the ring by induction. And recall that substituents that donate electron density will make the ring a better nucleophile they will stabilize the carbocation intermediate. They will thus activate the ring towards electrophilic aromatic substitution. But look at the chloro group, the carbonyl group, the nitrile group, and the nitro group. They will all electron withdraw electron density by induction. Now, the nitrogen, which is a nitronium ion, and the chlorine are both more electronegative than carbon, so that explains that electron withdrawal. What about this carbon? Well, these carbons are sp2 hybridized and sp hybridized, respectively. And even more importantly, they are bonded to an electronegative oxygen or nitrogen. So uh, they are, in fact, electron withdrawing by induction. So the carbon in the carbonyl and in the nitrile group are bonded to electronegative atoms, oxygen and nitrogen. How about the resonance effect? Well, this refers to the movement of electron density through the pi bonds via overlapping p orbitals, especially in conjugated systems. Atoms that have non-bonded electron pairs that are bonded directly to an aromatic or allylic system are able to transfer electron density in this manner. For example, the oxygen in, in phenol, which is directly bonded to an aromatic ring, is, is actually sp3 hybridized. It has um, four regions of electron density around it. And our argument is that phenol will actually rehybridize to an sp2 state. So it has one, two, three hybridized orbitals. And this is an unhybridized PZ orbital. And the reason it changes its hybridization state from normal sp3 to sp2 is so that these p orbitals can overlap with and donate electron density into the ring via the pi system, overlapping the uh, 2pz orbitals of the carbons. Note that the same atom, oxygen, for example, can withdraw electron density inductively. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, and yet it can donate electron density by resonance at the same time. And the net effect depends upon which one is greater. So the hydroxyl group is electron donating by resonance, but it's electron withdrawing inductively. But we've already observed that 
the high child Groxel group is ring activating, and so its resonance effect must be greater than its inductive effect. Take a look at chlorobenzene. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, so certainly by induction it is electron withdrawing. It does have unhybridized orbitals. Remember, a halogen that is singly bonded is unhybridized, and so it has uh, 2px orbitals with a pair of electrons that can donate into the pi system. And yet, recall that chlorobenzene is roughly 30 times slower in EAS reactions than benzene. And so the effect of this resonance donation must be rather weak in the case of chlorobenzene, whereas it's very strong in the case of phenol. Why the difference? Well, in the case of phenol, this oxygen is donating from a 2p orbital to a carbon 2p orbital. There's good overlap. They're the same size. They overlap quite well. But the resonance effect from chlorine is from a 3p orbital into a 2p orbital, and they're just not lined up. The 3p orbitals are farther away, and so there's very poor overlap. And so the inductive effect overpowers the resonance effect, and in fact, chlorobenzene is less reactive than benzene, but phenol is many times more reactive. Let's look a little bit deeper at these electron donating and electron withdrawing groups. So electron withdrawing groups have the general form aromatic ring bonded to Y, which is pi bonded to Z. And Z is more electronegative than Y. So Y pi bonded to Z. Think of carbon as being Y pi bonded to Z, where Z is more electronegative. So notice oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. It's electron withdrawing. Aldehydes are electron withdrawing. Esters are electron withdrawings. Y pi bonded to Z. Uh, carboxylic acids, electron withdrawing. Ketones, electron withdrawing. Sulfur is pi bonded to two oxygens, which, and, which are more electronegative. Same deal. Y pi bonded to Z. Likewise, nitrile. Y pi bonded to Z. So all of these are electron withdrawing. We've already discussed the quaternary amines and the trifluoromethyl group. The trifluoromethyl group while well, the fluorines are very electron withdrawing, so that's strictly inductive. And in the quaternary amine, like a quaternary amine or the nitro group, while well, they're, they're nitronium cations, so they're going to be electron withdrawing. Not resonance effect, simply by induction. Groups that donate electron density by resonance will have the general form aromatic ring bonded to Y, where Y has one or more non-bonded pairs of electrons like an amine group. It could be a primary amine, a secondary amine, or a tertiary amine. All of these have Y with one or more non-bonded pairs of electrons that can donate by resonance. Also ethers and phenols, as we've already discussed. And here's a secondary amide and a tertiary amide. Again, we have Y directly bonded to the ring with one or more non-bonded pairs of electrons to donate. These are all, can donate, all of them, by resonance. Even the halogens, which are overall, the halogens are electron withdrawing, but they do in fact donate by resonance because the atom Y has actually three non-bonded pairs of electrons to donate. Well, um, in the case of fluorine, the best overlap would occur between a 2p orbital of fluorine and a 2pz orbital of carbon, but fluorine is so strongly electronegative that the net effect is that it's electron withdrawing. In the case of chlorine, its electronegativity is 3 rather than 4 for fluorine, so it's not as inductively withdrawing, but the overlap is weaker because it's donating from a 3p orbital into a 2p orbital. In the case of bromine, electronegative is 2.8, it's looking better for induction, only a slight difference, but the bromine will be donating from a 4p orbital, which doesn't fit well at all with a 2p orbital of benzene. And iodine, whose electronegativity is not very high, is trying to donate electron density from a 5p orbital, so very poor fit in this case. So really important uh, slide here, aromatic substituents are of three types. Uh, first of all, we have 
ring activating ortho paradirecting substituents in the far left here. So this scale is the relative reactivity of aromatics with these various substituents on them. This represents benzene with only hydrogen on it. The group to the left are what we are for referring to here, ring activating. They are activators. They are ortho paradirectors. We'll talk about why that in just a bit. But so the amino group is the best. The phenol is very good. Um, the ether groups are good. Amides are good too. Um, uh, alkyl groups and, and of course the weakest activator would be another phenyl group. Secondly, we have a group of ring deactivators, but still ortho para directing, meaning that the next substituent will be ortho or para to whatever substituents on the ring. In order of decreasing uh, activity, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And third, we have a group of ring strong deactivators that are meta directing. These will direct the next substituent to the meta position. But look at them, they all fit our description of a strong electron withdrawing group that we discussed earlier. Let's look at some examples. Benzaldehyde, for example, here's benzaldehyde, is a poor nucleophile for EAS because the aldehyde group is electron withdrawing, it's ring deactivating. Now this carbonyl carbon is bonded to an electronegative oxygen, so it is certainly electron deficient and therefore electron withdrawing by induction from the aromatic ring. Furthermore, it will withdraw electron density via resonance from the ring, and in so doing we'll see that the ortho and para positions are the most electron deficient positions in the ring. How does that work? Well, rules for resonance say a pi bond can break and become a non-bonded pair of electrons on one of the atoms, and this is prone because oxygen is much more electronegative than carbon. Now at the same time, another rule for resonance says that a pi bond can break and become a pi bond on the other side of the same atom. In so doing, these two electron movements produce a second resonance structure with a positive charge on the carbon ortho to the carbonyl group. Now, resonance, we can delocalize this charge over the ring. Another pi bond adjacent breaks and forms a pi bond, which now shuffles the positive charge to the position para to the carbonyl group. A third resonance movement shows the formation of yet another positive charge in the other ortho position. So the ortho and para positions are particularly electron deficient as a result of resonance with a electron withdrawing group. In fact, it is the meta positions that of all are have most electron density and so when EAS occurs it is meta directed. Let's take a look at phenol. Now, phenol, recall, is a good nucleophile for EAS. In terms of nitration, phenol nitrates about a thousand times faster than benzene. Although the electronegative oxygen atom is electron withdrawing inductively from the ring, it very effectively donates electron density by resonance because there's good overlap between the carbon 2pz orbital and the oxygen 2p orbitals. Hydroxyl groups are ring activating. Let's see how that'll work by resonance. So take a non-bonded pair of electrons from oxygen. It can become a pi bond on the same atom. Now this carbon will have five bonds if we don't then break this pi bond and it becomes a non-bonded pair of electrons. Giving rise to the second resonance structure, notice uh, we formed an oxonium ion, but at the same time we have a negative charge on the carbon ortho to the hydroxyl group. Move this non-bonded pair of electrons over to form a pi bond. Move the next pi bond over to form a non-bonded pair of electrons, and we have a negative charge on the position para to the hydroxyl group. Let's do it again. Move the non-bonded pair of electrons over to form a pi bond move the pi bond over to be a non-bonded pair of electrons and the other ortho position is now negatively charged. So notice that the ortho 
and parapositions are in fact electron rich. And so um, when EAS occurs, substitution will occur ortho or para to this hydroxyl group. Let's take a look at chlorobenzene. We know that chlorobenzene is a poor nucleophile. It's about 30 times slower for nitration compared to benzene. The highly electronegative chlorine atom will withdraw electron density out of the ring by induction, but chlorine also donates electron density via resonance to the ortho pair positions of the ring. However, as we mentioned earlier, the carbon 2p orbital and the chlorine 3p orbital uh, overlap is not effective because of their different sizes, and the inductive withdrawal effect is therefore greater than the resonance donating effect. As a result, chlorine is electron withdrawing, chlorobenzene is a poor nucleophile. But let's take a look at the resonance motions here. Non-bonded pair of electrons can become a pi bond. This pi bond then must break and become a non-bonded pair of electrons in the position ortho to the chloronium ion. Non-bonded pair of electrons can form a pi bond, and the next pi bond would have to move over, giving a negative charge on the para position. Let's move this non-bonded pair of electrons over to form a pi bond, move the next pi bond over to form a non-bonded pair of electrons. We see another negative charge on the position ortho to the chloronium ion. So in effect, uh, although the net effect is electron withdrawal from the ring, the ring is deactivated. Despite that, the, the ortho and para positions of all the positions have the best electron density, and so when substitution occurs with, with a halogenated benzene, it occurs ortho or para to the halogen. When a halobenzene does react by EAS, it is ortho para directing. Let's look a little further at substituent effects, and this is a bit of a simplification. All activating groups will donate electrons to the aromatic ring. They will stabilize the carbocation intermediate that's formed during EAS. They will lower the activation energy and therefore increase the reaction rate. And in a very simple way, we could think of any electron donating group pushing electron density into the ring either by induction and or resonance. And it's the ortho para positions in which that electron density will uh, come out, if you will, in a, an EAS reaction. It's these sites that are most activated, they're most negative. All deactivating groups withdraw electron density from the ring, either by induction or re uh, resonance or both. They will destabilize the carbocation intermediate that's formed. They will raise the activation energy and thus decrease the reaction rate. So you can think of it this way, electron withdrawing group pulling electron density out of a ring, and most of the electron density comes from the ortho para positions, leaving the meta positions uh, the least affected. These have the most electron density, so substitution will occur meta to the electron withdrawing group. Substitution will occur ortho or para to the electron donating groups. Let's do some problems. How about you draw a chemical reaction showing the major products in the following EAS reactions? You might want to refer to the chart on slide 25. Bromination of toluene. Well, here's toluene. You'll want to check the chart and note that the methyl group, the alkyl group, is a ring activator and it's ortho para directing. So the bromination will occur ortho and para to the methyl group, and hence we're going to have a mixture of ortho toluene and para toluene. How about sulfonation of nitrobenzene? So the nitro group is a ring deactivator. We can still sulfonate it using sulfur trioxide and sulfuric acid. In with one of these strong deactivators, it is the meta positions that are least deactivated, and so sulfonation will occur preferentially in the meta position. So here's M nitro benzene sulfonic acid. How about alkylation of phenol with N propyl chloride? Well, phenol is a ring activator. It's ortho para directing. 
so this reaction should work. But I want to remind you that when the chloride leaves, it's going to form a primary carbocation, which will rearrange to a secondary carbocation by a hydride shift. So the major product will actually be ortho and para isopropyl phenol. Yeah. So in the ortho para positions, it's the isopropyl rather than the n propyl group that adds. Acylation of benzene sulfonic acid with ethanol chloride. So here's benzene sulfonic acid, and here's aluminum chloride and ethanol chloride. Now when you check on the um, directing effect of the sulfonic acid group, you'll see that it's a strong deactivator meta-directing. However, because it's a strong deactivator, both alkylation and acylation proceed to such a small extent that we should simply say the reaction does not proceed. No reaction. So be careful with those. How about the acylation of acid analyte with propanoyl chloride? So here's acid analyte. And here's propanoyl chloride. And one of the good things about acylation is it will not rearrange like alkylation does. Furthermore, this is an activating group, so the acylation will work. The activating group is ortho and para directing, so we would expect to get both ortho and para substitution. This is N for propanoyl phenyl. So this is a four propanoyl phenyl acid amide. Disubstituted benzene, the additivity of effects. There are some rules. Take, for example, para nitro toluene. We have two groups, and their directing effects reinforce. There's only one product that will form. So the methyl group directs ortho to itself, and the nitro group directs meta to itself. No conflict here, and so only one product uh, results. Second effect, when you have two directing effects that oppose each other, then the activating group is dominant, but mixtures may form. Here we have two activating groups. The hydroxyl group is a strong activator, the methyl group is a weak activator. The methyl group directs ortho to itself. Of course, para, but para is not available. It's busy. The hydroxyl group directs ortho to itself and para, but again, para is not available. So what products will form? Well, you're going to get a mixture of, in this case, bromination. Bromine will substitute ortho to the hydroxyl group, as we see here. And it could also be ortho to the methyl group. But since the hydroxyl group is a stronger activator than the methyl group, the major product will result from the bromination of the position ortho to the stronger activator. Minor product, uh, ortho to the weaker activator. Here's a, a different example. We have uh, an activator, a methyl group, and a deactivator, a nitro group. Now, as it says here, activators outweigh deactivators. So you need, not, you need not even consider the directing effect of a nitro group or a deactivator if you have an activator on the ring. So the methyl group would direct ortho to itself or para. And forget about the nitro group, it's a deactivator. So we see uh, iodination in this position or over here to the left, ortho to the methyl group. Now what about the position on the right here? Well, that's the third rule. Substitution rarely occurs at a carbon that is between two hindered uh, meta-disubstituted sites. And the reason is it's too hindered. Now, it may not look like much here, but if you looked at the electron cloud diagram of the nitro group and the methyl group, they really are cramped and there isn't much access. Substitution rarely occurs at a carbon between two meta-disubstituted sites. So here we have the chlorination of metachlorotoluene. So chlorine is deactivating. Let's not worry about it because we have an activator, a methyl group. So the methyl group directs ortho or para to itself. But again, so we have chlorination in the para position, chlorination in the ortho position on the left, but not on the right because the site is too hindered. It's between two metadisubstituted substituents. The fourth rule is 
well, not really a rule, but it's a, it's a consideration. Whenever you have two deactivating groups on a ring, regardless of where they are, the third substitution is not impossible, it just becomes very unfavorable. We require a lot of heating and refluxing to get a third substituent on when there's already two deactivators on the ring. Let's get some practice. Where will EAS occur in the following aromatics? Here we have meta bromo anisole. Now, anisole is an ether. This methoxy group is an electron donor. And the bromine, the halogen, is electron withdrawing deactivator. So we need not even consider the directing effects of the halogen. We only need to consider the directing effects of the activator, the donor group. So the ether group is ortho and paradirecting. That this third site would not uh, be a site of substitution because it is between two meta substituents. It's too hindered. Next compound is N 2 chlorophenyl and methyl amine. Now, the nomenclature of amines is a fifth semester concern, so don't worry about it for now, but you should be able to uh, determine where the next substituent will occur. This secondary amine is a strong activator, electron donor. The halogen, as we just saw, is a deactivator. We need not consider the effect of the halogen and only the activator, which is ortho and paradirecting. So those are the sites. Next we have ortho bromo nitro benzene. Now both of these are deactivators, the nitro group and the halogen both. Now the nitro group is metadirecting here and here, and the bromine is ortho paradirecting here and here. So although they're both deactivators, they both direct to the next site and they therefore reinforce each other two possible products. And finally, we have meta methyl benzoic acid. Now, the methyl group is a weak activator, electron donor. The carboxylic acid group is a deactivator. So, again, you need not even consider the deactivator. Consider only the directing effects of the methyl group, which would be ortho and para to itself. And again, not this site because it's too hindered. All right, draw reaction sequences for the following reactions. Here we have benzene being converted into para-bromophenol. You need to consider the directing effect of each group. How will they affect the next group as it comes on? Well, as it turns out, both of these are para-directing, so that's not a problem. So you might think, well, I could brominate first and add the hydroxyl second, or perhaps I could add the hydroxyl first and add the bromine second. Well, let's, let's try the hydroxyl group first. To put a hydroxyl group on, you can't do it in a single step. It's a two-step process. First, you have to sulfonate. So we'll sulfonate the ring using oleum, sulfuric acid and sulfur trioxide gas, producing benzene sulfonic acid. Now, the sulfonic acid group is metadirecting, and so we need to uh, direct to the para position. We'll need to do the alkali fusion reaction next to make the phenol. This is done with sodium hydroxide at 300 degrees C, followed by hydronium ion, and it converts the sulfonic acid group into the phenol. Now, the hydroxyl group is paradirecting, so it's easy to say we can then brominate. Bromine and FeBr3 should give us para bromophenol. Now, what about the other sequence? What if we had, say, brominated first and then? did the sulfonation. Well, let's pretend here for a second that we've already brominated. There's a bromine here. We, it is paradirecting. We could then sulfonate, and we would get some sulfonic acid group here. And that's all good, but the, it all goes bad on the last step. If we want to then convert the sulfonic acid group into a phenol, the alkali fusion, sodium hydroxide, 300 degrees C, followed by hydronium ion will actually replace the bromine. Recall that the only substituents that can be on a ring during this process is an alkyl group. Anything else will be replaced. In the same way that the sulfonic acid group, group would be replaced, the halogen would also be replaced. So you must do the sulfonation first, followed by alkali fusion, 
followed by bromination to get this product. How about this one? Benzene to metachloronitrobenzene. Again, think about the directing effects. The halogen is ortho para directing, so that's not going to work. You can't have chlorine on here first. What about the nitro group? Well, it's meta directing. And so, yes, we, if we nitrated first, we should be able to chlorinate second and get this arrangement. So let's do that. Nitration, we use nitric acid and sulfuric acid to form nitrobenzene. It is meta directing, and we simply can chlorinate at this point. Chlorine with FeCl3 will produce meta chloronitrobenzene. Well, the last few reactions we want to look at are oxidation and reduction of alkyl benzene side chains. Do you recall that strong oxidants like permanganate will oxidize and cleave alkenes and alkynes? For example, uh, permanganate, that is hot permanganate, in acidic solution will cleave this alkene. A alkene carbon that's bonded to one other hydrogen is oxidized to a carboxylic acid. An alkene carbon that's bonded only to hydrogen is oxidized to CO2 and water. If you were to carry out the same reaction on benzene, you'd find there would be no reaction. Uh, it takes a lot more heat to oxidize benzene. These pi bonds are rather unreactive, less reactive than alkenes. Now, benzene, despite its unsaturation, is inert to strong oxidants such as permanganate. That is within reason. If you heat it up long enough, permanganate will, of course, chew the whole thing up, spitting out carbon dioxide and water. But under the kind of conditions we carry out alkene oxidation, the aromatic would be inert to it. However, aromatic rings make alkyl side chains easily oxidizable and they are converted into carboxylic acids. So for example, here's para nitrotoluene. If we take permanganate at 95 degrees C and water, the ring itself is intact, but this benzylic carbon with its hydrogens is oxidized to a carboxylic acid. So it's the alkyl side chain that is oxidizable rather than the ring itself. Note here we have n-butyl benzene with permanganate 95 degrees C and the oxidation, the cleavage occurs right here at the benzylic carbon and this first carbon stays with the ring forming benzoic acid and the other three carbons break away forming a three carbon carboxylic acid, in this case propanoic acid. Take a look at t-butyl benzene. Under the same conditions, permanganate at 95 degrees C, no reaction. No reaction because there is no hydrogen in the benzylic position. So note that it is the carbon to hydrogen bond adjacent to the aromatic ring, that is the benzylic carbon to hydrogen bond, that is attacked, forming the benzyl radical intermediate. So T butyl benzene has no benzylic hydrogens. So it is not oxidized under these conditions. A final note on the oxidation of alkyl benzene side chains. Terephthalic acid, IUPAC name 1,4-benzene dicarboxylic acid, is produced commercially by the oxidation of para xylene. Problem. Write products for the following reactions. So here we have ethyl benzene with permanganate and heat and hydronium ion. Well, this will be an oxidation reaction. Note that the benzylic carbon has hydrogens, so cleavage will occur here. We'll form benzoic acid, and we'll have a one carbon carboxylic acid, which would be named as methanoic acid, or common name as formic acid. Let's try the next one. Here we have something that looks like naphthalene, but it's been partially reduced. This, in fact, is called 1, 2, 3, 4 tetrahydronaphthalene. Oxidation with permanganate and heat in basic solution. Where will the oxidation occur? Well, right after the benzylic carbon. So right after this benzylic carbon, cleavage will occur here. 
and right after this benzylic carbon cleavage will occur here. So we'll have this large uh, dicarboxylic acid and a two carbon one here. Now in the presence, let me show you the products, but in the presence of basic solution our carboxylic acids will deprotonate and actually form carboxylates. So this is 1,2-benzene dicarboxylate or simply called orthothalate. It's the neutralized orthothalic acid. Similarly here, a 2-carbon dicarboxylic acid is ethane dioic acid or oxalic acid and its deprotonated form will be um, ethane dioate or oxalate. Draw a reaction sequence for the following. I'm going to convert uh, benzene into metachlorobenzoic acid. So you should look to see the directing effect of each group. The halogen is orthopara directing, so that can't be on first because it's going to direct the next group to the wrong position. However, the carboxylic acid group is metadirecting, which is what we need to put a chlorine on. So if we add the carboxylic acid first, we should be able to chlorinate second in this position. The only complication is you can't add a carboxylic acid directly to an aromatic ring. So we've just seen that we could take an alkyl group and oxidize. So let's add a carbon in a Friedel-Crafts alkylation. I'm going to form toluene. We've just seen that this benzylic carbon has hydrogen, so it can be oxidized by permanganate in hot acidic solution to benzoic acid. And then finally, we can chlorinate the metaposition, because this is metadirecting, to metachlorobenzoic acid. Bromination of alkyl benzene side chains. Side chain bromination at the benzylic position right here occurs when alkyl benzenes are treated with these two reagents, n bromosuccinamide NBS for short, as a source of bromine, and benzoyl peroxide. This is benzoyl peroxide, its structure. Uh, two benzoyl groups. Uh, it's a peroxide. Peroxide bonds are very weak bonds, about 35 kcals per mole. Mild heating, say 30 degrees C, will cause homolytic cleavage and producing free radicals. So here I'm showing the bond cleaving homolytically. Now PowerPoint doesn't allow me to write half arrowheads, so I'm using full arrowheads, but understand only one electron is moving in each direction, producing two of these benzoyl free radicals. Now the mechanism involves free radicals, but we won't uh, study that until a later organic course. So for this time it's a mem case of memory. If you want to brominate the benzylic position, as long as there's a hydrogen there, NBS and benzoyl peroxide gives a monobromination product. All right, draw a reaction sequence of the following. Let's take benzene and convert it to this product. Both of these groups should be orthoparadirecting. Certainly the halogen is. We know that a methyl group is orthoparadirecting, so in all likelihood the bromomethyl is also. It should be somewhere between bromine and uh, methyl in its characteristics, both of which are orthodirecting. How are we going to do this? Well, we could either brominate first and alkylate second. We could alkylate first, brominate second. I don't think it really matters in this case. Let's go ahead with the alkylation. We'll add a methyl group and form toluene by Friedel-Crafts alkylation. This is orthodirecting. We can brominate the position ortho to it using bromine in FeBr3. And the final step involves bromination, not of the ring this time, but rather the benzylic position. And that's done with NBS and benzoyl peroxide. So orthobromotoluene will be converted into our final product, which would be 1-bromo, 2-bromomethyl benzene. Let's try another one. Benzene converted to styrene. Now, Styrene is vinyl benzene. Do you recall that you cannot 
alkylate with a vinyl chloride or an aerial chloride for that matter so you can't add the vinyl group directly this would have to be created after you add two carbons so let's go ahead and add the two carbons in the way we know how it would be an alkylation reaction with ethyl chloride is there then a way to convert this ethyl group into the vinyl group? Well, we'd need to do some kind of dehydration or dehydrohalogenation. Well, we've just learned that we could brominate the benzylic position with NBS and benzoyl peroxide. This is then a secondary alkyl halide. We could carry out dehydrohalogenation, removing HBr to produce vinyl benzene using KOH and ethanol. And so one bromoethyl benzene would be converted into styrene. And finally, the reduction of aromatic compounds. Just as aromatics are inert to oxidation under normal conditions, well, so aromatics are inert to normal catalytic hydrogenation, the kind we would use for alkenes like hydrogen on platinum or palladium or nickel at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. So here if you took hydrogen on palladium at one atmosphere and room temperature, you will not reduce the aromatic ring. And alkene double bonds, however, can be selectively reduced in the presence of aromatics. So under the same reaction again, notice that this alkene is reduced under these conditions to an alkane. Notice the carbonyl is not reduced. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So to hydrogenate an aromatic ring, one must use a platinum catalyst at 200 atmospheres. And that's with hydrogen. That's a bomb. So 200 atmospheres is the same as 3,000 psi, hydrogen on platinum or palladium lookout, and that would reduce the aromatic ring. Now someone has discovered that rhodium, a very expensive catalyst on a carbon substrate, will allow the reduction of an aromatic ring at one atmosphere pressure, 25 degrees C, um, standard conditions. Very expensive, $2,500 an ounce, but if you can get some, um, you can do it safely. Now under these conditions, rhodium, um, hydrogen on rhodium or hydrogen on platinum at 3000 psi, the aromatic ring is reduced to a cyclohexane. The alkene is certainly reduced to the alkane and the carbonyl is reduced. It's reduced to an alcohol. We'll look at that next. So the reduction of aerial alkyl ketones. Now, first of all, aliphatic aldehydes and ketones, like this aliphatic dialkyl ketone, is difficult to reduce by catalytic hydrogenation. It requires high pressure, about 5 atmospheres, elevated temperatures, 80 degrees C, and special catalysts like rainy nickel. It's an activated nickel. Under such conditions, aliphatic aldehydes and ketones are reduced, but they're reduced to alcohols. So if you recall the hydrogenation of an alkene on a platinum or palladium catalyst, the hydrogen uh, breaks apart, dissociates and forms hydrogen atoms on the, on the catalyst surface, and they add across the pi bond, forming, in this case, an alcohol. Seems reasonable. Now, just as benzylic carbons are prone to oxidation, so benzylic carbonyls that are adjacent to aromatics and aerial alkyl ketones are prone to reduction. Here's what I'm talking about. So here is a, a benzylic carbon, an aerial alkyl ketone. So in this special activated position, aerial alkyl ketones are easily reduced um, with catalytic hydrogenation under normal kinds of conditions. Hydrogen at one atmosphere and 25 degrees C, and the carbonyl is reduced, but it's not reduced to the alcohol. It's reduced to the methylene group. So note especially that reduction, the reduction product is not the usual alcohol, but the carbonyl is reduced to a methylene group in this special case. Thus, primary alkyl benzenes, this is a primary alkyl benzene, can be prepared by a Friedel-Crafts 
acylation, whereas they would tend to rearrange if prepared directly by alkylation. So here's what I'm saying. If you wanted to make n-propyl benzene directly by alkylation, it would fail. Because recall that the primary propyl carbocation is primary. It'll rearrange to an isopropyl group, and you'll get primarily isopropyl benzene, cumene, rather than n-propyl benzene. So if you want to make n-propyl benzene exclusively, you can't use alkylation. But what you can do is carry out acylation. Recall that when chloride leaves, the acyl cation will not rearrange, so we add it directly. Then reduce under standard kinds of conditions, the carbonyl reduces to the methylene group, and we get our primary alkyl benzene without rearrangement. Note that dialkyl ketones are not reduced under these conditions, hydrogen, platinum, palladium, one atmosphere, will not reduce regular dialkyl ketones or aldehydes. Note, however, that nitro groups on the ring would be reduced to amino groups. So nitro groups are highly oxidized, and they are very prone to reduction by a lot of reducing agents, and certainly hydrogen would do that readily. All right, we're nearly done. The Clemenson reduction reduces all types of aldehydes and ketones to methylene groups. So here is any kind of carbonyl, any aldehyde or ketone specifically. Clemenson reduction uses amalgamated zinc and HCl at room temperature, reduces it to a methylene group. Similarly, another reagent that does the very same thing, the Wolf-Kishner reduction, yields the very same products as the Clemenson reduction. The reaction uses hydrazine, N2H4, and strong KOH at room temperature reduces any aldehyde or ketone to a methylene group. Now both of these reagent sets, Clemenson and Wolf-Kishner, will also reduce nitro groups to amino groups, but neither of these methods will reduce carbon to carbon double bonds or triple bonds. Now we didn't draw reaction mechanisms, so it's difficult to see, but we can try and rationalize this. Amalgamated zinc and hydrazine are both reducing reagents, and so they will not likely react with carbon to carbon double or triple bonds, which are also reducing reagents. Nucleophiles repel nucleophiles. But then why would these reagents react with the nitro group or a carbonyl group? Well, the carbonyl group has an electrophilic site. The carbon in the carbonyl is electrophilic and electron accepting, and so these electron donors could in fact react there first, and that's the way they do it. In the case of a nitro group, it's similar. I didn't draw one, but recall that a nitro group has an, a nitronium cation, which is definitely electrophilic. And these nucleophiles, these electron donors, these reducing agents, would react at the nitronium cation. Well, let's get some practice with the reduction of aromatic compounds. So here we have an aromatic with a lot of unsaturation in it. If we want to hydrogenate on a standard catalyst like platinum or palladium or nickel, at room temperature of one atmosphere. Well, we know that the aromatic ring is not reduced under these conditions. That will remain intact. The nitro group is highly oxidized and easily reduced, so that will be reduced under these conditions to an amino group. A carbonyl in the benzylic position is susceptible to reduction, so that will be reduced to the methylene group. And of course, this vinyl group is an alkene, and alkenes are in fact reduced by hydrogenation, so that should be reduced to an ethyl group. So our product would be then 2,4-diethylanilin. Let's try the other side. Using Clemenson reduction, amalgamated zinc in HCl, or hydrazine in KOH, the Wolf-Kishner reaction, either of these gives the same product. Now, neither of these reductants will saturate the, the aromatic ring. That'll be intact. 
they certainly will reduce uh, the nitro group to an amino group and they certainly are designed to reduce all carbonyls to a methylene group but these reagents will not reduce another nucleophile this uh, vinyl group should stay unreacted so our product would then look like this and that would be called 2 ethyl 4 vinyl aniline Let's draw a reaction sequence for the following reaction. So here we have benzene going to 3-ethyl-aniline. Now, best place to start is to look at the directing effects of each of the groups. Both the amino group and the alkyl group are orthopara directing, and neither of these groups will direct the next group, meta, to itself. So we have to think backwards. What was the precursor to the amino group? We can't add an amino group directly to a ring. Uh, it was the nitro group, and the nitro group is in fact metadirecting. So that looks good. Would could we then uh, nitrate first and then alkylate second? Well, do you see the problem with that? The nitro group, if this was a nitro group, is the nitro group's a strong deactivator, and you cannot carry out acylation or alkylation with a strong deactivator group on the ring. So we'll have to try to put this group on first and the nitro group on second. So if we then add the ethyl group, well, that again is orthopara directing. We need it to be a meta director. What if it was a carbonyl? What if we added ethanoyl chloride? We would then have the meta directing effect. And that's what we want to do first is acylate with ethanoyl chloride, also known as acetyl chloride, to give us methylphenylketone also called acetophenone. This carbonyl group is metadirecting. We should be able to nitrate at this point with sulfuric acid and nitric acid to give us 3-nitrophenyl 1-2-3-nitrophenyl ethanone. And at this point now we can reduce both the carbonyl and the nitro group uh, using a variety of reducing agents. Certainly hydrogen on nickel, palladium, or pat platinum at room temperature, wood atmosphere would be just fine for that. All right, this is the last slide. Draw a reaction sequence for the following. We're going to convert benzene into 3 propyl cyclohexanol. The first thing you probably notice is the fact that the aromatic ring has been saturated to cyclohexane. And the only way to do that at room temperature under uh, reasonable conditions is use the rhodium catalyst. But we want to do that as a last step because we need the aromaticity to bring about the substitution and add these groups we're looking at. So think of this as being the second last product um, with the aromatic ring still intact. We have a hydroxyl group and a propyl group. Now, both of these groups are orthopara directing. Neither will direct the next substituent meta to itself. So think about the precursors to these groups. You can't add a hydroxyl group directly to an aromatic ring anyway. It'll have to be added as a sulfonic acid group first, and then converted by alkali fusion to a phenol. So what about the sulfonic acid group? Well, it is meta directing. You could then direct the next substituent here. But can you add an alkyl group when you have a sulfonic acid group on the ring? No, you can't. See, benzene sulfonic acid is extremely deactivated. The sulfonic acid group is a deactivating group, and you cannot then alkylate or acylate. So we're going to have to work over here to start and put the phenol on later. All right, so we need to add a propyl group, and also we need it to be metadirecting. So why not add it as an acyl group, three carbon acyl group? That would be propanoyl chloride. No problem with that first reaction. And this carbonyl is metadirecting. Now, it is a deactivating group, so you couldn't alkylate or acylate at this point, but we don't need to. We already have our carbons in place. So our next step would be to sulfonate meta to itself. This, by the way, is ethylphenylketone. Uh, sulfonation with oleum is sulfuric acid and sulfur trioxide, and there we have a 1, 2, 3, and this is 1 propanoyl benzene sulfonic acid. Okay, looking good. We're getting there. Next thing we want to do is reduce our carbonyl group 
before we carry out the alkali fusion because recall the only thing that can survive the alkali fusion is an alkyl group so let's make this an alkyl group we want to reduce the carbonyl I would use hydrogen rather than wolf kishner or Clemenson reduction I believe the hydrogen would certainly reduce this carbonyl and it probably will not attack the sulfonic acid group you would definitely not want to use the wolf kishner reaction because that uh, deprotonates its basic solution and I think either of those would attack, attack this electrophilic sulfur. So the reduction of the carbonyl gives us three propyl benzene sulfonic acid and from this point then we need to carry out the alkali fusion to convert the sulfonic acid group to a hydroxyl group that would be um, sodium hydroxide at 300 degrees C and hydronium ion looking good and our, that would be three propyl phenol and finally our last step would be reduction with rhodium on hydrogen 2,3 propyl cyclohexanol good question well that's it and thanks for watching this intro to reaction mechanisms of aromatic compounds